Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and welcome back, Kristen Palacey. Thanks for having me. Our co-host today. We're going to have a discussion about black and white birth in America. Are there disparities between outcomes for white mothers and babies and black mothers and babies? And if so, why are there disparities and what can we do to improve the situation? My guest today had her first baby in a hospital setting that felt overly interventive and lacking in warmth and intimacy. She had her next two babies at home, surrounded by family, friends, and supported by midwives. She became an educator and doula for many years before becoming a midwife herself several years back and now supports growing families in the greater Los Angeles area. Debbie Allen, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So I love every time I'm around you, I learn something new. And um, I'm always inspired by you. I think you're awesome. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're here today. Um, so I was really surprised to find out that uh, there's a giant disparity in outcomes for uh, black women versus white women and black babies versus white babies born in America. Huge. For uh, women, they are three to four times more likely to die within a year of having the baby. And that's a 234-ish percent increase, which seems alarming and huge. Um, but it's verified. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot of data on it. Um, I would like to say also that our outcomes in, in America for mothers and babies in general is not that wonderful compared to other countries. And that also compared to other countries, we're actually slipping uh, down compared to other developed countries. We're, we're having worse outcomes uh, than we had, let's say, 10 or 15 years ago, whereas other countries are improving. And that's with pouring a lot of money into and technology into childbirth. What's going on? Well, I mean, I guess the issues with birth in general is that, I, I, in my opinion, it's it's too micromanaged, it's too medicalized. So women don't have the opportunity to trust their body. Women are induced more often. Um yeah, it's just very medically managed in whether you are, have a high-risk pregnancy or a low-risk pregnancy. Sometimes that's appropriate, but most times it's not, it's not necessary. For black women and babies, it's, it's systematic racism and biases in health care and how, how, how we're treated in the health care system that, that makes a difference. You had your uh, first baby in a hospital. I did. You didn't love the experience. I didn't. You know... Um, I had all the interventions. I had an episiotomy, an epidural, all the things that I didn't want. Um, and I just felt like I wasn't heard. I felt like when I asked a question, it was um, – they treated me like I was imposing on them, even though I'm asking a question about my own health care and the care of my son. So for me, those things were really I, – I, I, you know, my doctor had a really great bedside manner, and I, I thought she was great. And, and when, I, when uh, my son was born, I realized that – her view of birth and what I viewed of birth were completely different. Mm -hmm. But really the determining factor why I would, when I left the hospital, I looked at their dad and said, I'll never have a baby in the hospital again, was um, I had to be sutured. And two doctors that I had never seen come in while she's doing that. And they just start chatting about the weekend. And for me, it was really, it was like the, the fact that they didn't realize that that was completely inappropriate really bothered me. Mm. So that, that was the determining factor. That was like the thing that pushed me over the edge. And I said, "This for me, this is not the way for me. That's interesting. We uh, we did a documentary on uh, breech babies called Heads Up. And one of the moms who had a cesarean just because she was breached, so it was a, a sort of like a quote-unquote routine or scheduled cesarean, um, she was in there and she said one of the things that really struck her was that the people in the room were talking about the basketball scores while they're getting her baby out yeah. as if nothing is going on, nothing sacred is going on, nothing's important in the room. Like she's almost not even there. Yeah. Um, she's just like they're plumbers working on plumbing. Like, exactly. And um, she was just there really, really bothered her. And I can, under I can understand that. Yeah. It's just, you know, it just takes away the intimacy of what birth should be and just respect for a woman's body. And what's happening during that process. So, and even the next day when I asked questions about my son and I, you know, wanted to make sure that he was with me, the, the, when the shift change happened, the nurse said, um, oh, I heard all about you. And I wasn't really <laughs> being difficult. I just had questions like, you know, is it, is it a problem for me to ask a question? And, and time and time again, I think for black women, women in general, but black women even more, we're not heard. 
even though we're we're asking questions, we're trying to have a conversation, they're not hearing what we're saying. Right. So I, I what's even more alarming, because you would initially wonder if the disparity is that there are more advantaged white women and disadvantaged black women. And so perhaps as a pool in the United States, white women have better access to uh, health care doctors and hospitals that black women don't have access to different sets of health care for different people. But when you look deeper, you find out that the disparity transcends socio- socioeconomic class. Absolutely. So a wealthy black woman with exact same access to the health care that a wealthy white woman has, or not just even even for labor and delivery, but even in terms of, of general nutrition and ability to work out with a trainer and things like that and be healthy before, during, and after the birth, um, still has that three to four times more likely to die than the white woman. So it can't just be advantage versus dis- disadvantage, wealth versus lack of wealth. Um, so racism really becomes the spotlight. Yeah, I think black people specifically and people of color in general have been saying time and time again that that continuously when we move through the world, we're not getting treated the same. And, you know, you hear comments like, well, even even when you see, I mean, in general, everything, we've been saying that for a very long time. And I think now with videos that, you know, people are all recording things on their phone, you get to see a peek mm-hmm. into what we've been saying that has been dismissed for forever since the beginning. So I, I, in healthcare, it, it just, that systematic racism transcends everything. It, it permeates through every piece of life that we experience. So, yeah. Is that, do you feel that way in general? Oh, absolutely. Even when I was a doula, when I'd go in with white clients, even as a midwife, when I go in with white clients, that, like if there's a transport where they need to be at the hospital as opposed to having their baby at home, the the, the care is very different. The language is very different. The the When you go in with people of color, they assume that the mom is a single mom and that they refer to the baby as uh, the the father of the child as the baby's daddy, as opposed to the you know is this your spouse? Those are the, those are different. It's just different kind of language you hear when you're with people of color and white women. Very very different. So I know, for example, we there's this mechanic that we used to take our car to, and there's no question that when my wife would take the car in, she would get treated very differently than I would take the car in. The conversation that they had with her is very different than the conversation that they would have with me, um, even for the same thing. So she would take the car in and then not like the conversation that she had and and just leave. And then I would go back and have a conversation about the same thing, and it would be a completely different conversation. So, um, you know, there's sexism built into that yeah, but most of the time, definitely, for sure. But but typically, I'm dealing with couples. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm just saying there, it's just the same The same place of business will treat two, two different people differently, um, in that case, just based on gender. Right. So it, it does make sense to me. I mean, look, I read somewhere that you, you sort of size up somebody and make your opinion about them in the first 10 seconds of, uh, of knowing them. What are you basing that on? Right. And if, if, if the only opinion you have of, of African, people of African descent in this country is what you've seen in the movies and what you've seen on the news and what you've see, the, the the narrative that is constructed about us that is not true, then that's what you're basing it on. So when you come in, you assume like you assume that you're a single mom. You assume that you have used drugs. You assume that you're on medical or welfare. You You assume all those things about people of color and, and African-American women in, in, in general that you don't assume with other people. So those microaggressions, I mean, imagine if you just go through life with constant micro, microaggressions, but imagine if you go through your health care where you're, where you're already disadvantaged because you're preoccupied with the reason that you're there and you have microaggressions, microaggressions, microaggressions. Like that, it, you shouldn't have to fight like that. You shouldn't have to. You you should be able to just go in and get care based on who you are, with all without all these preconceptions of who you are based on biases. I mean, two people, regardless of I would say gender or race, should be able to go and get the same exact assessment and treatment. Um, but it doesn't work that way. Ever, I don't. I won't say ever, but most times it doesn't it's not. typically work that doesn't way. Doesn't typically work that way. No. Here's here's a question. Do you? 
Wait, first of all, what do you mean by microaggressions? I mean, microaggressions are just like that, uh, assuming that this woman is not married to her partner, when maybe she is. Why would you make that assumption when I can go in with a white client that doesn't, that those assumptions aren't made? Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a, there, there, I had a client that, um, who just had another baby eight days ago, that um, there was a demise. Her, ba- her baby passed away in utero when we got to the home. Um, she pushed out her baby eight minutes after we got there. Baby had died in utero probably a couple of days before that. It was very obvious that that happened. Um, we transported to the hospital. She also had, had a, a retain. And, and we go in. Not only did they take her husband. So, so, so you, have a, you have a couple who has lost their child who's transported to the hospital, home birth. Uh, the, the death of the baby didn't have anything to do with the home birth. It, was, it just happened. You, she, she goes into the hospital. Um, she gets the care that she needs. This goes on for maybe 45 minutes. An hour after we had been there, they call the sheriff's department on us. The sheriff's department takes the father of this child, her husband, to their house, has him stand outside for three hours while they search their house from top to bottom. They drug test the mother. They, um, I mean, I, I almost got arrested. I mean, that kind of really aggressive, over-the-top um, scenarios that happen to us. I mean, I've, I've transported with many, I've worked with many midwives of all colors. And I, I've never seen anything like that happen to them. That's really incredible. So it's just that you, you, you assume that they did something wrong. You assume that there was... You know, why, why would you search? Why would you take a father from his spouse, this couple that has just lost their child, to his home to search it for three hours? I mean, things like that. When I, that's an extreme story, and most stories aren't that extreme. But when when we say that the treatment that black women are getting in the hospital is not the same, it just isn't. Right, but I, I think the it's the now that I understand what you're saying, the microaggressions are are almost a bigger problem because they're so common. Um, and and those microaggressions, it, you know, they play on your pregnancy. They play they play into how you you grow your your baby. You know, they play into high blood pressure. They play into stressors. They play, like you don't feel comfortable talking to your to a provider who always who already has a a, a bias, an obvious bias against you. And you know, you don't want to. Sometimes you get fight, tired of fighting for all the little things. Like you're you sometimes you the bigger picture is you you need care. So instead of addressing every little comment and Every like or or even <laughs> even when 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 you're you're in a, a medical situation and and the doctor starts to talk like they assume black people talk like stuff like that it's just it's so obvious to us and I think less obvious to other people because they're not experiencing it. But also those micro like when you come and tell a story like that, my heart is fell into my stomach because I I've, I've I work with laboring clients in right. general and and. I've seen similar situations unfold completely differently. Um, But when you just say, well, I don't feel like I'm hurt as well, that's not going to really move anybody. But that's happening all the time. Yeah. And those not being heard, not being listened to, not being respected, not being taken, you know, we, we know things as patients that nobody can tell from doing diagnostic tests and and medical tests. But if, if we're not being heard, you're missing a very big piece of the clinical picture. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the New York Times, I'm sure you saw had an article uh, about a woman who was preeclamptic, and she just, she kept saying, Absolutely. I don't feel good, and she wasn't heard. Um, and, of course, Serena Williams, yeah. after she had her baby, she knew she was having an embolism, and she wasn't heard. I know, and, 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 you know, Serena Williams is a woman who has money she's educated like she's she's well known she's a she's a celebrity and and you still aren't being heard and those are based on people you know they they people feel that black women have a tolerance to pain that's different from other people it's just it just <laughs> it never ends it's like they they you you constantly have to prove who you are prove what you're saying is 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 actually happening and you're you're talking to someone who just doesn't believe that that's the case for you. And a white woman can come in and say the same thing, and you're going to run diagnostic tests for them. 
So why is that? I think care providers really need to examine their biases. And a lot of people don't really feel like they have biases, which is the problem. Well, I, I, that's an interesting thing that you bring up because, first of all, I think when you say the word racist, right, or racism, um, it's a very – it's a heavy word. It's a sharp, heavy word. I think we all like to think that we are not biased. And, well, biased is a lighter word. I think we all like to think we're not racist. Like we don't judge people just based on on race and treat people differently just because of race. And um, it's possible that that somebody is. It's possible that I have racism built into me that I don't even know about, that I don't realize is happening. But the word is so strong that it's like, whoa, I'm not a racist. Right. I'm not a racist. So it's hard to address it. It's not hard for us to address it. It's probably hard for people who – don't feel like they have any biases against other people to hear it. I'm saying it's, I, I'm going to take myself as an example. It's hard for me to think of me as a racist. Right. Or that I have, you know, racial judgments and, and treat different pe- people differently based on race. Right. Um, and lately, since I've been prepping for this podcast, I, I do stop and think all the time. Every time I get into a different situation now, um, am I treating this person exactly the same way? Am I judging this person based on how they look? And I don't always know the answer. But like I said, you, I think that people make an impression when you meet somebody new for the first time. You have an impression of that person within 10 seconds, and you have really very little to go by other than the cover. Right. You know nothing about this book. But if your references to black people are – you have no references. You know, you have no personal interactions. Like you don't have friends. You don't – you. you if that's not the world you live in, even though you interact, like we live in Los Angeles, it's multicultural here, but so you're, you're not going to drive through your neighborhood and not see other people, right? right? But if you don't have any personal interactions with people, what are you basing your, you know, your sum up when you sum someone up in you know, 10 seconds? What, what is that based on? I agree with you. Like 100%. we have to examine what that is based on. Is that based on what, we've, what media has portrayed? A certain group of people as is that is that based on who they are? Is that based on what you know? Is that based on history? Like what is that based on? I think that's the question we have to ask ourselves all the time, and and it's it's particularly important if it's if it's if people's lives are on the line. So if you're a care provider, you have to address that. To me, that's like the scariest part of all of this is that as healthcare providers, you're taught to in school, right, to how to diagnose that you're not supposed to put any of your personal preference or your personal ideas into how you treat someone. So anyone coming off of the street, whether they are, you know, rich, don't have any money, are somebody who's poor and have nothing, you're supposed to treat them. But regardless of anything else, you're supposed to take them as what they are bringing in front of you and listen to them as part of a history to diagnose. Because 80% of the history leads you to a diagnosis. So if you're not listening to somebody, regardless, how how are they making choices for people? You know, and a lot of people come in with not knowing much about their body's anatomy. Uh, the general public, I think the, there's a statistic that they have, like, anyone in general, uh, it has, like, a sixth grade idea of anatomy if that's not what they study. So if you don't know that and you're trusting these people who are supposed to take care of you, Especially in a time where it's so like, you know, when you're very vulnerable as a pregnant woman. Um, That is what I think was the scariest thing for me reading all of this was that those are the people you're supposed to trust. So if you go there, like as a woman in the story that you just told, I mean, all I thought about was those that poor couple. Right. I mean, that is such a t- – to lose a And child. I'm not even telling you the details of everything right. that happened. I'm giving you a, a, a summary. St- a summary <laughs> which is even – because it, yeah. it, I'm sure it was much it was, worse. It, it was the most intense thing I've ever seen in my life. It was, it was ridiculous. Yeah, the synopsis is intense. Yeah. So, I mean, for that, for that couple, it's just – I don't even know where you begin to – what levels you start to heal first – you know, on that. I mean. and, and, I, and I think as a, as, as a for, I'll speak for myself, as a black woman, you see, you, because you've dealt with this all of your life, right. you spot it immediately. You know where it's coming from. You can, the body language is different. You can see it. You can see it when people walk in the room. You, you, you are, we are very aware that that's where, that's the space it's coming from. Mm. And we're very aware when it's not coming from that space. 
because this is something you, this is how you maneuver through the world. But if you're not looking at a woman who's pregnant, and if you're not, when that woman is coming and she's talking to you, if you're not taking into consideration the stressors right. that, it, that, that come with being a black body in this world, you're missing half of who they are. If you're looking at your, if you're looking at your, if what I hear all the time, which is really annoying, that I don't see color, then you are eliminating a huge part of who that human being is. Because to move in the world as a bl- in a black body is a very, very different, ex- different experience than moving in through the world in a white body. So if you're going to negate all that, you're already missing a huge piece of who, the, who that person is. And how can you treat a person if you don't know who they are? Like, how do you, if, if, all the aspects of who they are that contribute contributes to their health. If you don't take those into consideration, how, how can you care for them? Mm. It's impossible because you're eliminating a huge piece of what's happening to them and what's happening to their bodies when they're not only when they're growing humans, just in general. Right. I think that I feel like a lot of the racism in healthcare may be unconscious. Do you agree with that? No. You think it's deliberate? I mean, do I think some... What is consciousness? Is consciousness that you choose to not examine why you think the way you are? You think? Because that, to me, that's a cop-out. If I, if you, if, if, if you... I'll go even more basic than that. Someone that doesn't realize that they're treating two different groups of people two different ways. I don't know how that would be unconscious. You have to, you, I mean, I don't, I don't, for me, I can't imagine that that's an unconscious act. It's a, it's a, it's something that you don't want to pay attention to, but you know, that's why racism exists in, in, in everywhere because people don't want to pay attention to their, they don't want to be responsible for their actions. I think that, that what I was getting at earlier is when you start to point it out, people get defensive. Exactly. And we have to get past those defenses to have a solution. And hopefully in the second part of our podcast, we'll talk about solutions. But but I, I do believe a lot of it is unconscious. I, I think that sometimes they don't even realize they're doing it. Look, I think that in obstetrics in general, a lot of the terms that we use are, are very derogatory towards women. Uh, if the cervix starts to dilate early, we call it an incompetent cervix. That's a horrible term. What does that mean, incompetent? Um, if the cervix is dilating slowly when she's in labor, it's failure to progress. It's a terrible term again, failure. Um, the mucus plug, I think, is uh, could have been called a pregnancy cap or something nicer than mu- mucus plug. And I think that <laughs> at the end of pregnancy, when 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 you're ready to give birth, what happens to the mucus plug is you lose it because you're an incompetent failure. Like all the term, I lost my plug. You have to actually call somebody and say, I lost my plug. Why not say I released my plug, my my cap, because I'm ready to have my baby now. I don't think those terms were set up to be demeaning, but they're terrible terms. Men don't get that. We get we get things like erectile dysfunction. It's like, uh, you know, you poor baby, what happened to you? I feel so bad for you. And even then, it's not like, it's most of it's working good. That one function is not, you know, imagine they called it incompetent penis. It would be a whole different situation. So this is this is what, a, a male versus female medical system looks like, right? But young doctors who are being trained now, whether they're men or women in obstetrics, use those terms, and I don't think that that they even give any thought to the terms. So, but the 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 obstetrical terminology for things that you are being taught is mm-hmm. one thing. To walk in and and give care to someone based on what are you basing that what are you basing that care on? Like you, I don't. I think saying that someone uh, that 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 you know racism is 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 people aren't conscious of it is no, is not is, all racism. No, not all. I'm but what that, we're I talking th- about I think that here. there's an element of really good natured doctors who come into work every day wanting to help. Then why would you be defensive if someone brought it to your attention? Because if you are truly a good natured doctor coming into a room wanting to help, then if I say to you what you said is incredibly offensive, and mm-hmm. it's actually racist. Then the first thing you would be, the first thing I would do would would want to understand why. Tell me more about that, because I don't want that ever to happen again. I don't want anyone to ever feel that way when I say something to them again. So to say that it's just uncomfortable, because it's it's not like we're just letting things go. We we people say we say things all the time. Well, there's a spectrum. I think that there are people that when you point it out to them, they do they that would be their response. What what do you mean? What happened? Tell me more about that. I, I I didn't mean to offend you. I'm so sorry. 
um, then I think there's another group of people that would get defensive. And and I think you get defensive because racism is such a strong thing. You, you don't like to think of yourself as, as being racist or biased. But, 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 but I guess my biggest issue with that is that, of course, you don't want to think of yourself as racist. But if, if the person that you're dealing with is telling you that this is incredibly offensive and you don't want to be viewed as a person who's racist, why aren't you open to hear and listen to what they have to like why are you defensive about that because you, you at, you're this is you're someone's care provider right yeah. so you're the only way you're going to provide competent care is f- to be able to see this person so it, in doing that if you are if they're saying something to you that's that that is clearly offensive to them why would that make you defensive? So I think, because uh, you keep saying you. I no, think, not you. I know. I mean, definitely <laughs> not you. I think I am that person that if you point to, and, and things not about race, but in general, sometimes a patient will point out, hey, I didn't like this experience. And and it it is devastating to me. Like, what, oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. I would never want anybody to feel something negative in my office or under my care. So I think I am that person. But I, I also think that there's people who, who detest racism so much that to be called on racism would would shock their system. They need to be shocked. Agreed. Yeah. Shocked. I also I think shocked they need to be shocked because the, the bigger picture is that they're not the victim. The person who has uh, th- that the racism is directed to is the victim. Absolutely. So if you're incredibly shocked and offended, like so what? You should be because the behavior needs to change. So I think I mean. But I if understand they, if, if what you're saying. they don't even realize they're doing it. You know what? Because – and the reason why they don't realize they're doing it, Elliot, is because white people can walk through this world without having to address any of those things because yes. they don't affect them personally. Yes. So that's not my problem. What I'm saying is that <sighs> it's offensive and I don't care that – you are just so offended that oh my god I couldn't I I love everybody I don't because you, you don't you don't understand how many times I hear when when because this <laughs> this topic comes up all the time for me right sure and you don't you don't understand how many times when I bring it up like that that's like that's it that I'll give you an example I I took my son to to buy a car right um, we go to test drive the car the guy comes out and he goes. You don't have you don't have any warrants or anything. You're not like you don't are you what? In, that that was the first thing he said to my son. And we're like, what like what the heck? Like what who how we're here to buy a car. Like why why would you say that? You don't I mean I'm gonna I'm gonna check your license. So he goes to check the license and me and my son are standing there, and we're like, dude, that's he's so racist. Like that's ridiculous. So he comes back and I say, you know, would you if he was blonde hair, blue eyed, would you the first thing you that comes out of your mouth when we're coming to purchase a car at this facility, would it be uh, I hope you don't have any warrants? Like, why would you assume that? He's like, oh, it was just a joke. It was just a joke. Like, dude, that's not funny. No. That's that's like. So what what I'm saying is that being unconscious is because you, white people have the privilege to walk through the world and not be affected by anything. So that's great for them. But other people are suffering because of that privilege that they have. So I, I don't I don't ever want. It's really important for me to 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 say that I don't think that I don't believe in unconscious racism. I believe that you have white privilege and you don't have to deal with that. But th- there's a difference. You 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 don't have to. So unconscious is like you don't. There's no. You don't have any realm around anything. You have the privilege of not of those things never ever happening to you, and so you don't have to deal with it. And and you it doesn't affect you. So that's that. So there, it, you, I think to say that you know some people are really great people, but they're just not you know they're, they're, this is a completely unconscious thing is a cop out, and it, and it gives an excuse for people to say like, well, you know I'm really a nice person, I just like I, I don't I don't like I don't know like I'm just no, you get to have that mentality because you wa- walk through a world with privilege that many people don't have. Sure, well, I'm looking to see how we can improve healthcare for all and decrease these disparities by improving the statistics and the care because the care is improved for black women and babies um, and equal to the care that's received by white women and babies. Um, but I, I, my sense is that there is – my sense is that some racism is overt, some racism is overt, and some racism is not overt. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I do – believe that some people, the numbers are so staggering that I feel like there are, are people who are treating 
black patients, white patients differently, and don't consciously realize that they're doing that. It's but it's it's that, and it's also the the, the statistics are so overt because the effect of racism on black bodies is huge, and so that plays into that. So not only do you have to be a conscientious care provider and realize that, you have to do things to make that different. All right, I want to. Um, I'm learning a lot. I'm glad. I'm glad I, I don't know what it's like to walk through the world as someone who's judged and and treated differently yeah. because of my skin color. I, I've been in situations where anti-Semitism plays a role. Absolutely, and it does not feel good. Right. Um, and um, I I want to learn more, and I want to be part of the solution. When we um, are going to come back, we're going to talk more about potential things we can do to change the situation. We're going to take a quick commercial break and be right back with midwife Debbie Allen. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and your co-host, Kristen Palacy. We are continuing our discussion with Debbie Allen about racial disparity in American childbirth. Uh, all right. So <laughs> I, there's a clear problem. There's an obvious problem. I, I printed out all this research about from California how one in seven African-American babies are born too early or too small. Um, African-American babies are more than twice as likely as white babies to die before their first birthday. Um, and different states publish data. New York has some very similar data. Um, and like we said, even the New York data very clearly shows it transcends uh, socioeconomic class. And um, really, it's hard to explain these outcomes without without pointing the finger to uh, systematic racism that that people are treated differently. White and black patients are treated differently in child childbirth, but also in general. Um, I would like to look at solutions. Yeah, and, me, me too. Okay, good. <laughs> so I, I would open it to you first and, and kind of see what kind of ideas you have I for mean, solutions. I mean, if uh, everybody could just, well, I don't know. Let's start with you. Please, please. Oh, well, I was just saying if everybody can have their baby with Debbie Allen at home, it would be wonderful. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> I think one, we, you know, we, we can't, the, the piece of this that we can't negate is the, the effects of systematic racism on people's bodies and their health in general, independent of pregnancy, just in general. That is issue number one. In healthcare, so you're you're dealing with someone who's always at al- already at a disadvantage because you know e- for us even on a subconscious level, it's we're we're we we deal with this all the time. So then you get them in. So then you you have a woman who's pregnant, and you have to have a care provider who hears her, who listens, and c- who can come from a perspective of understanding that they walked into the office with the effects of systematic racism on their bodies and how that's going to affect their pregnancy. So I think. W- Care providers have to examine their, their biases. They have to examine why, who they see when that person walks in the room. Do they not see color? Which means do you, not, you don't see that person? Do they um, have a preconceived idea of who this person is based on stereotypes? Like you have to examine really what, what you're looking at. I, for me, um, when I'm dealing with, with women, with, with people when they're pregnant, it, it's I know that they they know that I see them and they know that I hear them. And it's easier to to be open about what's going on with you when people see you and hear you and you don't and, and you're not being judged for that. I mean, I think that's something that's special about you in general. Oh. That you have a really good I mean, you uh, you're one of those people I've said this before about one other person on, on the podcast when I when I picture you, because especially because I'm face blind, I just <laughs> picture it like a, a big heart. Um, Thank you. We had you also as a guest on the Real Midwives of Los Angeles, and um, 
we were working with a woman who gave birth very prematurely, and it was right after the premature birth, and she already had a toddler, and she was really struggling hard and, and had a lot of guilt and was blaming herself. And I sort of felt like, I, once you started talking, I just felt like I need to shut up and listen. Um, I just saw a big heart, and she related to you really well, and you could tell that you felt, almost felt what she was going through and were able to comfort her in a really magical way. Um, you mentioned during the break we took, you mentioned an interesting thing, because I, I said since I've been doing this research, um, I sort of, when I meet somebody new, I, I instead of giving myself the 10 seconds sum up, I am trying to start to think more about um, what am I judging this person based on if all I see is the cover. Um, and you said it's probably a good example to uh, a good exercise to sort of uh, look at people and write down what you think initially of them. And then you can kind of see your own way of how you judge people. Um, and then I, I went on a bigger scale and I thought it would be really cool to do medical school experiments of presenting clinical findings and a patient and um, the students would be able to ask the patients questions and come to clinical conclusions um, and to have uh, different patients of different ethnicities come through with the same exact presentations and see how medical school uh, students what their findings how they might differ or be the same from patient to patient from different classes and races I you and I butt heads a little bit and respectfully respectfully but I think you know, I, I don't have the world experience that you do of walking, living in the United States with the biases that you're subject to. So I, I definitely defer to you. And the only reason I continue to butt heads with you is because I'm trying to find solutions. And I'm trying to understand how in a large health care system where there is systematic racism going on, I think there are some people who are more overtly racist and some people who are more less consciously racist and don't necessarily realize that they're doing it. <laughs> You're so funny. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> because you've very um, strategically said the exact same thing without using... Unconscious. Unconscious, yeah. Yeah, because I'm agreeing with you. You're having an effect on me. <laughs> um, but I think, would you not agree that there are greater and lesser degrees of consciousness? Yeah, there's greater and lesser lesser degrees of consciousness, but you know when, like I, I we're gonna disagree on 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 saying that people are unconsciously racist because I you you know I think I'm, that's I'm not gonna they're... disagree too much on that because I I think it me, the term means different thing to me than it means to you. But why is that? Is that because I'm a black woman and you probably people don't they don't they don't assume have assumptions about you. Yeah, uh, sure. I agree with that. Yeah. I, I mean, I said that from the beginning. I defer to you because I don't walk through this world with that type of bias at me. You know, people first get to know me before they dislike me. <laughs> it's, it's different. Um, but I do feel in my heart that there are a, a large number of providers who who are not so conscious of the of the way they judge people differently and that if it was pointed out to them that they would take a serious look at themselves and try to figure out how to change that. There are some, I agree. And so I think that might be the low-hanging fruit on, on a good place to get started. And, a good, uh, and, and, and another good place is to get started is for white people to check white people. So when they hear those comments, when they hear, you know, when when they when they see those things going on, they'd be the ones to say that's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be the responsibility of, of us to to always correct bad behavior. Like we this shift is not going to happen unless people who don't look like me check other people when they hear bias and racist statements or just comments or just assumptions so, you know, it, it, it's not just I, I don't think it it shouldn't be the 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 person who's being victimized. They shouldn't have to be responsible. I agree with that. you 100 yeah. percent. This is a, this is why I'm here tonight. Yeah, exactly. But I think that in in all forms of health care training that there needs to be. I mean, when I went to chiropractic school, we didn't have any courses or presentations on on this topic. Mm -hmm. And. In retrospect, there there needed to be. 
Like, Absolutely. Somebody needed to come in and say, hey, you're going to be the new crop of healthcare providers. You need to know that there's bias in healthcare. And it, and it can't be something that the, the, the best training are trainings that make you feel. Mm-hmm. for this type of thing. So it can't be something that, you know, like you just have to go through and check the boxes and you're like, okay, I I, I finished my, my, you know, the racist, non, don't be a racist section of my training. It has to be something that's really comprehensive that makes you feel yeah. what's happening. And, and that's not really happening. Well, I feel like when you point out these this disparity when it comes to childbirth, you have to be numb not to feel it. I mean, I think people are like, oh, that's that's awful. And then, and then they just keep moving through their lives. Oh, for just, me, just like with everything else. Like people hear, you hear a lot of the things that are going on that are that that systemic racism is 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 the cause, and you're like, oh, that's that's awful. But then you have the option to just you know keep keep going through your life. Yeah. What kind of things would you say would make about to graduate new doctor really feel it? I mean, that's a big question. I don't have all the answers, quite honestly. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to figure out the answers. As well. I mean, I guess definitely comprehensive training from someone who specializes in this mm-hmm. and and in-depth training, not not just a, a you know, a, a two-hour class you have to take. Right. So I think it should be a, a required course, not just a, a workshop, but right. a required course that right. as you go through it. Um, I it, mean, and that course has to deal with, you know, history, like all the things that, that lead to, to – how black people are treated today, where that came from. You know, it's layers to all of this. It's, it's, it's you know, it's very strategic layers to But I had nothing. Did I mean, Chris, and you graduated much more recently. I mean, they talk about it a little bit, but more of, the, like, the special populations, they just kind of, like, generalize. It's like, you know, geriatric um, pregnancy and whatever. They They talk about certain things, especially with, like, medications for us, like understanding that why we need to, like, I think in pharmacology, they did a little bit of a better job Mm because they were trying to say, like, hey, we need to know this for these reasons so we can catch it first. Like, hey, we're supposed to be the front line. So, but it's not anything, like, you're talking about. It's more like... It sounds like it was mentioned once in a while. Exactly. Which is more than I had. Right. So, progress. But But in a different sense, not really so much about, like... Race. Race. More about, like, these things happen. There are, like clear problems with healthcare but and not how why. do we help them? Yeah. yeah. And not why. And not why. Yeah, exactly. No why. And the why has to be addressed. So I think any kind of healthcare provider who comes out, whether it's hol- holistic or allopathic, p- part of your training should be required to take a, a full course that goes through everything that you're talking about and things that we probably can't think about right now, but it would have to be developed to show the full picture and to give – Providers who are graduating, a sensitivity, an awareness, a knowledge, a passion for making sure that it doesn't happen in their practice. And it should probably be something that's ongoing, not something that you take to graduate, but something that you have to take every year. Continuing or, edu- or part or, of yeah. continuing Pro- education. Yeah, like the law portion or Absolutely. ethics. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. It's always or broken down ethics. like that. Yeah. Technique, law, ethics, and, mm-hmm. and, um, and this should also be included in there. I agree. But you also mentioned something interesting, which is that a lot of that that judgment comes from things that we see in the media. So I always use also an example for childbirth. People who have no idea what childbirth is like, haven't really been exposed to it, and then are pregnant, and everything that they know about childbirth comes from TV, movies, and newspaper headlines, are terrified of childbirth because the assumption is that Really, every plane is either going to have engine trouble and fall out of the sky or be hijacked by terrorists or have snakes on it. Like, that's all you're exposed to. You never really consider the possibility that you could just take off, have a smooth flight with a nice snack and land safely. So if the media portrayal of black Americans is negative. Would you say that it is? um, Would you say that it is? (laughs) I mean, I don't. I'm I don't, not in the media that much, but certainly okay. in news, right? So just news. That's just news. From news, absolutely. Okay. From news, absolutely. From television and movies, I'm not sure. I don't because I'm face blind. I don't really watch a lot of TV. News, news. is important. That's where people get what they consider real information. Right. And and a lot of it's fake news. And a lot of it is fake news. So yes, absolutely. In in newspapers and 
and news media, a hundred percent. I think that um, the portrayal. If you if you are a non black person who never has interaction with black people and all you know is what you see in the news, I think that you would judge them very negatively. And a, and a lot of people, even though like we live in a place, you know, there's some states that are, that. Are there you don't see a lot of diversity at all. We live in Los Angeles. There's a lot of different people here. So it's different to move, you know, in a world where you see others, but do you interact with them? Do you mm-hmm. know them? Do you have personal relationships with them? Do you have any other opinion of who they are other than what's been given to you? That's completely different. But then the question is how do you change the media? Yeah, I don't know. That's oh, a, yeah. I mean, that's a whole other beast, I feel like. Because the media, I think, just doesn't do a service. If you want to find information, you have to go look for it. You can't. And I think that's also like a responsibility for everybody. Because if you just believe what you see on news, then you're not getting You're getting what they want you to know. Exactly. And there's so much. I mean, personally, I like to watch the news from different countries. Because at least they'll tell you what's going on. (laughs) You know? Um, But I think that's also, like you said, a choice. And if people aren't aware or take responsibility that you ha- you're you part of all of that, uh, however way that is, I don't think there will be much change. Yeah. And you're part of it even if you – like if you can you, – you can still be really nice to everybody and still be part of it. Because if you're not part of what changes, what shifts it, then you're part of the problem. If you're not conscientiously part of the – of creating something or participating in something that shifts this dynamic – then you're, you're complacent and you're part of the problem. Um, I have a question for you, which is if you're pregnant and black, do you have recommendations? And I've been both of those things, pregnant That's right. and black. I've, I've been neither of those things. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's hope. Maybe one day. For which? <laughs> <laughs> um, do I have recommendations as far as what? What what, what they should – what pregnant – a pregnant person should do, a black pre- pregnant person should do? Yeah, it? I mean, for, because all, I think everybody today, no matter what's going on with you healthcare-wise, you sort of have to take the bull by the horns right. and and be an active part of your own Absolutely. healthcare team. But since there is this huge disparity and since there is racism in the system, what can a pregnant black person do to look out for themselves, to – um, help themselves have a better, safer, healthier experience during pregnancy, postpartum, and the first year after? Um, I'd really research who you choose as your provider. Interview. I think people don't realize that you can. You, you don't have to just go to... I mean, and, and it, you know, the other issue is, is economics. Like, if you're on Medi-Cal and you, this is the provider they've assigned to you, it's much harder to to switch. To switch. And sometimes it could, you could go through almost your whole pregnancy before you were able to switch to a new provider. So that's a whole nother issue. And they change that a lot too. And they like. change that a lot. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother problem. But I'd say really research who, who you're dealing with if you have that option. And if you don't, really ask questions. Really um, speak up for yourself. If you're pregnant, definitely get someone to advocate for you, a doula, someone where you have... You have someone to bounce this information that you're given to make sure that it really is what should be working for you in your pregnancy. And just really remember that you have a voice and that you, you can say no and you can um, you, you can request someone different in the room and you, you, you have options to speak up. Mm-hmm. I think we just think we get, you know, a lot of people in healthcare, not just black folks, a lot of people, you get the doctor you get and those are your options. Know that you, you definitely have other options and you have a voice. Yeah, I I feel that a lot when I support pe- people in labor is that, um, you know, they work for us, right? But it, they make it feel like sometimes like you like they're doing us like favor. we work for them yeah, absolutely. And these are your choices, and you're done. But that's not the way it works in our country. It's not the way it's supposed to work. It isn't. I mean, and that changes depending on your economics, and that 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 that's a whole different conversation. But. You still ha- you're still able to say something. There's, you should never feel that just because I think people are a little bit intimidated by doctors and that feel like they because they don't know what they know they don't they you know they don't know what to say. Well, but, also you're kind of sometimes naked and sitting on deli paper and it just doesn't feel that very empowering. vulnerable. Yeah, <laughs> you are vulnerable. I mean, and me you're too, vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you're vulnerable. Right. But it's just really important that we do that. 
Like um, it was important for Serena to keep saying like, no, this, I'm telling you something's wrong. Like you, sometimes that you just have to keep at it, keep at it until someone listens to you. As a provider, what are some suggestions you have for healthcare providers who aren't black and don't have that perspective? How do you have like good, um, I guess, tips on how to make someone, if you don't understand that perspective, to feel listened to? Or like how can they change that? Like how do they change the conversation, I guess? Or do you know what I'm trying to ask? Like, so what are your, for the other side, the healthcare provider, Mm -hmm. if that's not where you come from, how do you, you say a lot of people don't feel listened to. So what is the, like, what are some things that you would like to see change on their end? Like, so that you could hear, but maybe we don't hear all the time. Like, so that they would be able to hear that person? Yes. Like, understand who that person person is. Exa- examine your biases and why you have them. So that you are able to ask the right questions. Understand the dynamic of someone coming into your office with the, the the stressors of systematic racism, like how that affects their bodies. Like understand, like read and understand that perspective. So where should they go find that information? Like about stressors or if they don't, I mean, just saying, like they might not know where to do that. It's, I mean, Google it. I mean, I don't mean, I'm not trying no, to. I'm not saying it for me. But I mean, I'm just, really, but I'm it's just out, saying, it's, it, like, it really it is out there. It's easy to yeah, access. Yeah, it's easy. Right. It's very easy to access. Because not everyone can, not everyone has that ability to, Address like to if you never started that conversation with yourself to address your biases. Yeah, but, but, yeah. But what so, I'm saying is that if that's something you want, yeah, research it like you would anything else because the there's there's so much information out there to help with that. Right. There's programs. There's classes. There's so much information out there to help with that. Are there good classes? I mean, where would you start? I mean, I wouldn't recommend. I mean, I'm not going to recommend one in particular. In particular. Okay. Yeah. On I just didn't know if you podcast. like if there's like right, but, but yeah, if but, there were but better there, ones there, than others. There, there must be. Right? Yeah, there are lots. Right. And, and so just I, keep looking for mm-hmm. them, basically. Yeah. I mean, because it has to be something you want to know. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Just like anything else that would be important to you. Even if you knew nothing about it, you'd find that information because that information is important important to you. So as a care provider, treat it the same way. So make it an important thing you research. Yeah. Make it something that is important enough for you to find out. You know, just recently here, I think it was on a Saturday is why I didn't go. Um, but uh, there was a gathering and presentation on race, racial disparity in, in um in pregnancy and childbirth, it was a workshop, and uh, all of the follow-up information that came out of it was very positive. How how helpful and impactful it, it will hopefully be. So I, I mean that's an area too. If if you don't have them going on in your community, then create them. Yeah, yeah, and find ways to bring them, them there. That's be, good. Be a part of the solution. Well, for not um, only for yourself, but for your for for your, your colleagues, one hundred percent, your colleagues, yeah. yeah. I um I hope I I didn't offend you today, and Not at all. I hope I didn't offend any of our listeners. I'm I'm genuinely curious. I'm genuinely introspective. Um, I grew up in a in a very sheltered community of not just white folks, but Orthodox Jewish white folks. I was very surprised when I got outside the bubble that uh, not everybody's Jewish um, <laughs> <laughs> and other shocking things. Um, so I'm still learning. Um, I'm a provider. I'm a healthcare provider. I like to think that I I I I learn something from everyone, every person I meet. I don't know, always immediately know what I learned from them, but I know there is something to learn from everyone, regardless of who they are and what they look like and where they came from. And that's what I try to focus on is um, what can I learn from you? But I am going to do exactly what you said and examine my biases and where they came from. I'm going to work hard to learn more. And just um, and continue to have conversations, continue to create spaces for conversation like this. I yeah. mean, that, that, you know, just like you said, you didn't know. A lot of people, I guess, don't know. So, like, to continue to create spaces for people to learn and for people to, to examine, you know, why they think the way they think. Are you, um, where can we find you online? You can find me, I'm Tribe Midwifery. That's my business. You can find me at www.tribemidwifery.com. You can find me on Facebook. Um, Instagram, all those things, Tribe Midwifery. And zipping all over the Los Angeles area. And zipping all catching over. Catching babies. <laughs> Absolutely. This, this is the second time we've sat down to have this podcast. It the is. first time I think we got four and a half minutes into oh, it. sorry. <laughs> and, and you got called out to what seemed like two births. I did. At the same time. So 
I'm glad we made it through. <laughs> Superpowers. Um, <laughs> um, Kristen, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. And uh, Debbie, like I said at the beginning, I always learn a lot when thank I'm around you. you thank and you. I hope to spend a lot more time around you. Thank you. At home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting podcast. If you have a topic you'd like to hear about, just send us an email, info at informedpregnancy.com. And then visit us online for lots more information about pregnancy and parenting at informedpregnancy.com. Doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a whole lot of questions for you. This kid's gonna test my will. I got a lot to learn and my brain.